When I first went back to stay in Bangkok, the second time to study with the John Fuhring and to ordain. For a first monk back there, I was staying in Bangkok, because that's where he was, teaching. And a group of us would sit with him, lay people. And he had a special talent. If anything interesting was happening in your meditation, he'd know right away. If someone had something special happening in their breath, or if they had a a vision or light of some kind. You just speak right up and ask them, are you experiencing light now, experiencing a vision right now? Then he tell them what to do with it. Of course, I was all ears. Of course, and it made me want to have some light and have some visions too. And the problem was that I ended up not paying that much attention to my breath. I was just sitting there waiting. When is a vision going to come? When is the light going to come? without realizing that we're not there for visions, we're not there for light necessarily. We're here to get to know the mind, get to know the body. Because that's where the real problem is. And if the lights and if the visions are going to arise, they're not going to arise because you simply want them. You have to do the work. You have to be intent on the work. This comes under the third of the basis of success, was intent. When you really give your full attention, really in, fully engage yourself in what you're doing, you don't hold anything back. This intent is made out of three qualities. The first is mindfulness. You keep remembering what you're here for. You're here to stay with the breath. You don't forget. The second quality is alertness. Keep watch over the breath, keep watch over the mind. In the John Lee's image, it's like having a rope over a pulley. Sometimes you pull it in one direction, sometimes you pull it in another direction. In other words, you watch over the breath and you watch over the mind. Make sure that they're together. If they're not together, you know. This brings in the third quality, which is ardency. You're trying to really do this well. You're giving your whole heart to it. That means if you're not with the breath, you come back right away. No matter how interesting the thought, if, even if the thought isn't complete, you just drop it. After all, you're not here to think about other things. So let those thoughts stay unfinished. You just come right back to the breath. While you're with the breath, you're trying to make your powers of observation as refined as you can, as sensitive as you can, so you can really see what's going on. Because the more sensitive you are to the breath, the more comfortable it becomes. You begin to notice. Right here is not comfortable, so you smooth it out. Right there is not comfortable, so you smooth it out. There's a little bit of tension here. Release it. And the more you can do that, the more comfortable the breath becomes, and the more your mind can fully settle down. It's like the princess and the pea. The princess is lying on top of twenty mattresses, and there's a pea under them. And if she's really a princess, she knows. That's the kind of person you want to be with your meditation. The slightest little discomfort in the breath, you want to smooth it out. So the mind feels confident in its ability to settle in. Now to do this, you've got to make your awareness both still and broad. both for the sake of seeing what's going on in the breath and for the sake of seeing what's going on in the mind. This is why the Buddha says when the breath becomes comfortable, you start spreading your awareness to fill the whole body, from the top of the head down to the toes, out to the tips of the fingers, all around.
but the whole body, getting equal attention in every part. If you can do that, you're going to fully be in the present moment. There's nothing left to grab hold of the past, nothing left to grab hold of the future. Every part of your body is saturated with awareness. You're still but fully alert. As some of the forest of John say, this is like it's like being a hunter. You want to go out and catch an animal. You don't know when the animal is going to come or where it's going to be. The best thing to do is go to where you know the animals like to go, and you you sit there. Very still, but very alert, all around. You're still so you don't scare the animals away. And your alertness is all around, so that no matter which direction they come from, you'll know. You'll hear the subtle sounds. In the same way, if you want to get insights into the breath, insights into the mind, you have to be still but alert all around. I was reading a book on tracking one time, where a hunter talked about how you track animals in the forest, how you try to see where their footprints are. And he made much the same point. You have to be fully present, and your range of vision has to be all around. He called it soft focus, or scattered focus. But what he means is you're fully focused, but it's in a, with a wide range. And that way you pick up where the tracks might be, where you might not expect them. Because you never know when they're going to come, where they're going to come from, which direction. So you have to make your alertness all around. And it has to be very sensitive, too, because sometimes these tracks are very, very slight. Reading this made me think of a time when I was looking after John Fuang, after I ordained. And after I'd been with him long enough so he trusted me, he let me be his attendant. He had a bad case of psoriasis. And the problem with the psoriasis is that lymph would come out through his skin, get into his clothes, get into his bedding, and it would, it would attract ants. In Thailand, they have these little tiny, tiny ants that like to bite. And no matter where he slept, the ants would find him. So it meant that before I slept, I'd have to wipe down the room with kerosene to repel them for at least a little bit. And before I put down his bedding, I had to make sure there were no little ants in there at all. These tiny ants. So I had to check every square inch of the cloth. And I found the best way to do that was to get my mind as still as possible, get my range of vision as broad as possible, because the ants might be in places I wouldn't expect. And then check every part of the cloth, both sides. That way I was able to pick out the little tiny ants that might be there. It's the same with the meditation. Try to get yourself fully with the breath. Make your awareness all around. So you can see the subtleties of the breath, the subtle movements in the mind. Because as I said, the more you can see the subtleties of the breath, the more you can make the breath even more and more comfortable. And as for the subtleties of the mind, they're both good and bad. The bad ones are when hindrances start to arise. All too often we're aware of them only when they're full-blown, when they've taken over. The time you want to see them is when they're just beginning to arise. Just a slight little movement. It starts out, it's hard to say whether it's in the body or the mind. 
There's a little quivering. Then it stops. Then it quivers again. Then it stops. And something in the mind said, oh, this is a thought about X, and then you go running with it. You want to catch yourself before you go running. That way these thoughts don't disturb the meditation. They don't disturb your concentration. You see the quivering and you dissolve it. And you've nipped it in the bud. As for the good things in the mind, you read about how when the mind is concentrated, there is pleasure, there is rapture. And you sit there waiting for a really intense pleasure and uh, intense rapture suddenly to come. Well, they come gradually. And in the beginning, if you don't appreciate them for what they are, you snuff them out. Say, this isn't much, this isn't what I want, and so you leave them. What you have to do is protect them. Say, oh, this is the beginning of pleasure, this is the beginning of rapture. Let's protect this sensation in the body, allow it to grow. In Thai, John Fuin would use the word brakong, which is the word you use for when a child is beginning to learn how to walk. You hover around the child. You don't grasp onto the child because you want the child to be able to walk on its own. But you don't leave it. You're right there, just in case it falls. In the same way, you want to hover around the good sensations in the body, protect them. So you can allow them to grow. So in this way, if you're really intent on your meditation, in other words, you're fully engaged, not just fully aware, fully engaged in what you're doing here, you can wipe out the bad things in the body and the mind and give the opportunity for the good things to grow and show their potential.